Thanks for watching Powerful Lessons number two. Today we will be talking about the king side pawn targets and the weaknesses that come in pushing king side pawns. This lesson is in fact so important that it's going to take up two videos. This one is going to be about pushing pawns and the next one is going to be how to force a weakness in your opponent's position if you won't voluntarily make one. I hope that you enjoy this lesson and you find it very instructional. Let's look at our first game. e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop c4, bishop c5, c3, and queen to e7. So at first this move looks really weird, because normally you play knight to f6, or even d6, but not in this position. Because if white decides to play d4 now, black does not have to take with the pawn, because he can just move his bishop right back, and white does not get any crushing attack in the center. So if we look, after d4, now the bishop can just move right back, it's all safe, and now white makes a weird move, a4. So I'm pretty sure you guys can all see that the possibility of the bishop actually being trapped is like 0%. So the point of this move is to get the bishop out of play. And this goes against the whole idea of develop all pieces before starting an attack and before starting a combination. Because without all your pieces on the board, you just lose time. This loses time. After a6, a5, the bishop is tucked away safely at a7, and now black has a head on development. And now h3. So this move is very pointless. So sure, the bishop does want to come over to g4. It's where the bishop wants to go. But is it really going to go there? Maybe if h3 wasn't played, sure it would go there. But now, the king side is weakened, so you have to first take into consideration this bishop on a7. It's rather important in this game. If this pawn moves, the bishop is pinning the f-pawn, which now weakens the g3 square. It also weakens the whole king side. Now the pawn on h3 becomes a direct target for black. This bishop is aiming right at the h3 pawn, and it really wants to take it. So now you're going to see that after knight f6, d takes, now the knight takes. And now the knight is in the center of the board just where it wants to be. So knight takes, and now that just moves one of the defenders away from the queen si or the king side, and now it allows the queen to come out. And now black has three pieces developed compared to white's one bishop. So now knight to d2, protecting the pawn. Now, of course, black is not going to fall for knight takes, knight takes, queen takes, and then rook to e1, winning the queen. So instead, he plays bishop takes h3. And this is just the perfect move in this position. This is where the whole attack starts. Because now, after take, the king is open. And the queen can come to g3 and deliver a check and win back another pawn. And it's all because of this bishop on a7. So after the king moves away, the queen takes king to g1 and now knight to g4. So now it looks unstoppable. The mate on h2 is deadly. Knight to f3, the only defense. Queen to g3, check. King to h1. And now bishop takes f2. And that is game over. Because now the king's only escape square after queen to h3, check, has been taken. And now, mate follows on h3. So in this game, you saw that by playing h3, you severely weaken the king, and the bishop on the a7g1 diagonal, pinning the f-pawn to a castled king, is very strong, especially when you can get a queen to come to g3, and you can get a bishop to take the h3 pawn, opening up the king. Alright, so now let's look at a second example of why moving the h-pawn in front of your king is usually a bad idea. e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop c4, bishop c5, c3, and now bishop to b6. So, normally moving a piece twice in the opening is a waste of time. However, black wants the bishop to stay on the a7, g1 diagonal, hitting the weakest pawn on the board at f2. And after d4, the bishop is going to have to move anyways, so why not just move the bishop away now, but move it where you want it, 
because now after d4, queen to e7, and there's no need to take. After castles, knight to f6. So if black at all tries to win a pawn, again, the rook to e1 tactic pinning the queen. So instead, d5 is what white played after knight to f6, and this is actually better for black. It seems natural for white to play it, but it's rather weaker. So for one, this, the bishop on c4 is now weakened. It doesn't have as much mobility as it did. The bishop on b6 is now once again hitting the f2 pawn, this time pinning it to the king. And its mobility has increased. Also, white has moved a pawn forward while he still has his whole queen side back here on the back rank. And you've got to look. In the opening, move only the pawns that are going to help you develop and get an advantage. This move does nothing to help. So now the knight just moves back to b8, and if the knight moves to a5, we have bishop to d3, of course, and then followed by b4 later, which actually traps the knight. So instead the knight just retreats, goes home, bishop to d3, defending the e-pawn. However, you have to look, the three other pieces on the queen side are just begging to be developed. And now black has the edge on development. He has three pieces for white two, when normally it's supposed to be the other way around. So d6, and now h3. And again we see the blunder. White sees that the bishop does belong on g4, but h3 just leads to bigger troubles. Now the h-pawn itself is the target, not the square g4, not the knight on f3, not the pin, but instead the pawn on h3. So this time, black does not take back right away. Instead, he plays h6. So, wait, now you're going to say that black is good playing h6, but white is bad playing h3? Well, you have to look at it this way. First of all, black's king isn't castled, so it's not weakening the king. Also, it's actually the start of an important pawn storm, because black wants to support g5 next move. So let's look. Queen to e2. And instead of actually playing h3, he could have just did that right away and got out of the pin, because dealing with the pin is much better than weakening your king side that much. And now you see the pawn storm come in with g5. So now knight to h2 trying to stop the advance to g4, and now g4, and it still works after h takes, the rook moves to g8, and now the rook is on a nice open file where it's going to attack black's king. So now bishop takes h6, and now black is just begging to get back his pawns. And this is his last hope, because he sees his king is weak, he wants the material. And now, he just opened up the h-file for an attack. Knight takes, and bishop to e3. And now, it seems that there's going to be a big attack, and you're right, there is. Now, if let's say knight takes g4 instead, the bishop takes, queen to c2, and now bishop to f3, followed by rook takes g2, and there's a mate soon to follow. So instead, white here is going to respond to knight takes with king takes. And then queen to h4 check, king to g1, and now queen to h3 because the pawn is pinned, g3, rook to h8, which is just the beauty of the open file that white made, f3 to create an escape square, bishop takes e3 check, queen takes, and queen h2 mates. And that is how black wins because of this weak h3 move. So a key point of this video is the only time you should ever move your h-pawn is if you're going to use it to support a pawn attack with g5 or g4 to follow if the other opponent's king is weak. That should be the only time that you play it. Of course, there are exceptions like last video when you should have played it to kick out the bishop and release the king in the pressure of the back rank, but normally, it should only be used for an attack like this. 
Otherwise, it weakens the king severely, especially when there's only a knight and maybe one other piece defending the king. You have to watch out and not weaken the king. In fact, it's much better to face the pin that you would have got than to stop it in the first place. Because losing the king is much worse than getting a knight pinned to a queen. Alright, now we're going to look at one more game about king's safety and keeping the pawns how they are. e4, e5, f4, and bishop to c5. Now this is my favorite opening against the king's gambit. For one, it solves the bishop problem, which after d6, the bishop is trapped in. And also, it's on a very nice diagonal, stopping white from castling for a while, and it still protects the pawn indirectly, because if f takes e5, queen check on h4, and then after g3, queen takes e4, check wins a rook. So that's a little nice trap there. Of course, not many people fall for it. So normally in this position you'd see knight to f3, but knight to c3 also works. And if queen check, now just g3, and everything's fine for white. So now knight to c3, or knight to c6, and then knight to f3. Now, right here, if the pawn takes, d6 can be played. And now, even though white is up a pawn, black is going to have an edge in development. Because now he's going to have an easy time developing, all his pieces are going to go where he wants them, and white can't do anything about it. So instead of that, knight to f3 was played. So then e takes, and this is not a very good move. For one, black needs to develop his pieces. He still has pieces that are undeveloped. And also, now he loses the center, and he wastes time capturing a pawn which he cannot retain. That pawn is going to go anyways, probably, and now the center is strong for white. And, if you don't see the power behind white's next move, d4. Now it attacks the bishop, the bishop has to move, and the bishop is attacking f4. So when the bishop moves away to b4, so here it seems weird, but actually bishop to e7 is much better, because there needs to be some defense. The bishop taking a defensive post is probably much better here, because white is going to unleash a powerful kingside attack. And on b4, the bishop just sits there attacking a knight. And really, black doesn't want that knight for the bishop. He wants the bishop. And also, he needs to defend against the threats. So bishop takes, developing with a little tempo there, and then d5. So now black is trying to solve his problem in the center. And then e5. So this has a positive and negative effect. For one, white loses e5, which he would much rather have placed a knight on at some point. And also, it kind of cuts the bishop short. Now the bishop is just kind of stuck behind here. However, it does cramp up black's position. Now this bishop on b4 cannot really move back to these two squares. And also, this knight cannot go to f6 anymore. So now... Bishop takes c3, and here, black is probably thinking that the doubled pawns for white is good. However, he loses more time, because after captures, white still has an edging development. He needs to take his pieces out and put them on active squares, instead of trading off pieces. That knight was pinned. He could have taken it any time. And also, those doubled pawns, black can't get at them right now. Now bishop to e6. So bishop f5, of course, was much better. Put the bishop on a nicer diagonal, because you have to fight to control the vital squares, and the vital diagonals, the important files, and so on. Bishop to e6 really doesn't do anything. That pawn is not attacked, and it's not going to be attacked for a while. So he can play bishop to f5 and be just fine. So now bishop to d3, and h6. So... This move, I don't really get the point of, because it doesn't do anything. It seems to prevent white from playing knight to g5 and attacking the bishop, or even bishop to g5 and attacking the queen. However, each of those has a simple defense, 
Like, if you play bishop to g5, you just put the knight in front of the queen. There you go. Things are fine. You can play queen to d7 next and get out of the pin. And if he wants to take, alright, fine. And this is just a waste of time. Because white wasn't intending to do either of those moves. Instead, he wants to develop and get his pieces in the game. So here, the king is secured and the rook is on a nice open file. Now knight g to e7 and rook to b1. So it looks weird, but now the rook has a maximum mobility. While it was back here on a1, it only had two squares of mobility. However, now it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight squares of possible mobility. Also, black has to now waste time defending that pawn. So black plays b6. And there, there are better options, such as rook to b8, which keeps the pawns as they were. Because when you move, when you move a pawn, you can't move it back. Now, that knight on c6 is weaker because there's no pawn defending it. And now, queen to d2. So, a beginner player says that that's just a good move because it takes the queen off the back rank, connects the rooks, and now the queen is in the game. However, to a beginner, the move queen to e2 probably wouldn't make any difference. However, this puts the queen and the bishop on the same diagonal and attacks the king's side at the h6 target. And as you see next move, it's a good thing, because black walks right into the attack. So black should have asked himself, how can I exploit the doubled pawns on the c file? And this is what is called mechanical chess. It's when you know you're supposed to castle, and People say castle early, preferably kingside, and a player does that, no matter what. However, you cannot play mechanical chess. You need to think. Should I castle, and is it safe? Here, it is not safe, and black is much better to stay in the center. And now, bishop takes h6, of course. And you all saw that coming by now, I hope. g takes, and queen takes, and white has two pawns for a bishop, a well-placed queen, a very weak king to attack, and great development. His pieces are working perfectly. Also now, he threatens mate in one. So now the only good defense here is knight to g6. And then, knight to g5. So there are other ways to defend, such as, how about knight to f5? Well, that's just followed up by bishop takes, bishop takes, and that knight that I said was very weak now because the pawn wasn't protecting it is suddenly taken and it's hanging. So if the bishop moves to f5 instead, same thing happens. The knight that you saw was weak has been taken advantage of. And if f5, of course, queen takes e6 and the bishop is hanging. So knight to g6, the only good defense, but it still loses after knight to g5 threatening mate. Rook to e8, giving the king some room. Now, rook takes f7. So there were other options. There were two other options that lead to a quick mate. Bishop takes g6. F takes. Queen h7 mate. That works. Also, instead of rook takes h7, you could also play knight to h7. This is a harder one to see. However, knight to f6, it is an unstoppable fast mate. The queen's going to have to take. Pawn takes. You have a mate coming up on g7. But rook takes f7 also works because of bishop takes f7, queen h7 check, king f8, and queen takes f7 checkmate. So now you saw a few things in this video. You saw more than just kingside defense. You saw queenside defense and how pushing a pawn weakened a square. By pushing the b6 pawn, the knight on c6 was weakened, and in the end, you saw that that was taken advantage of. Also, you need to ask yourself, when you castle, is it safe to castle? Because after queen to d2, castling is unsafe, because mate followed in just a very few moves. You need to ask yourself, is it safe, and don't just castle because you can castle because you know it's safe, or that you have to. 
Now we're going to look at the importance of a Fian shadowed bishop on the king side. So, c4, e5, knight to c3, knight f6, g3, d5, c takes d5, knight takes, bishop to g2, and now, in this position, a ton of people play bishop to e6. So it looks good, it develops a piece, however, after knight f3, black has to respond to the attack on the e-pawn, knight c6, after castles, black needs to get castled, bishop to e7, and now d4, the game is becoming open, and the black king in the center here looks very weak. So, instead of going into that line, knight to b6, and right now, this bishop can wait. It does not need to come out to e6. It can come out to g4 and be even better. So, now, knight f3, knight c6, castles, and this, this position right here, is probably one of the safest kingside positions that there is. Having a bishop here on g2, having a knight there, and having this pawn formation. However, once you eliminate this bishop, it looks much weaker, and it is, because there's a hole on h3, a potential hole on f3, and now the bishop is gone, the knight's probably going to be gone, and now it's even weaker. White's king is then in danger, so keep an eye on this bishop on g2 for the rest of the game, and you're going to see how important it really is to the defense. So bishop to e7, getting ready to castle, d3, castles, and then bishop to e3. So normally, you don't see this, putting a bishop in front of a central pawn. However, white wants to keep the e-pawn connected to the king's side, and he wants to play d4, though. That's why the bishop is there. So now, bishop to g4. h3. So this move makes black make a choice. Either trade the bishop for the knight, or move the bishop away and keep the bishop. So here, black chooses to keep the bishop, and now the king side looks even weaker, because now, without this bishop on g2, the h-pawn is hanging. So, let's see how black tries to attack that weakness. Rook to c1, white wants some play here on the open file, and now queen to d7. And this move is what attacks it. Now, there's a little threat here. If bishop takes f3, the pawn has to take, because if the bishop takes, queen takes h3 wins a pawn. So, there's a little tactic right there, so now something has to be done about that. So knight to a4, and here white is creating a, a diversion of controlling the c5 square. He wants to put a bishop or a knight on c5. And now, black needs to think whether he wants to respond to that or respond to the king's side weaknesses, and he chooses to stay focused on what's important, and that's the king side. So now, it's either white plays bishop takes bishop and loses the pawn, or pawn takes and either has doubled pawns, weak position, trapped in bishop, and now the pawn is protected, I guess, but now this bishop is trapped in, it's going to have a hard time finding a good square to go to, and now you have doubled pawns on the f-file, plus an isolated d3 pawn. So, white chooses to play bishop takes f3, and it seems like it's good if you can see the upcoming combination. So, white here knows that he's going to win back his pawn after queen takes h3, bishop takes knight, b takes c6, and now rook takes c6, and here white should be happy. He got what he wanted, he got his pawn back, he's attacking the c7 pawn, However, it's not that easy. Knight to d5, a beautiful move. It protects the c7 pawn. It also attacks the bishop on e3, and then after the knight takes the bishop, if the pawn takes the bishop, then g3 falls with check, and now the king's side is extremely weak. So now white has to respond to that. Queen to e1. This move indirectly protects g3, so now if the f-pawn is to move, the queen is protecting g3. So now f5. So here black's plan is to move knight to f6, and then knight to g4, and then mate is unstoppable. So why didn't he do it yet? Well, if knight to f6 now, white can just play f3. And now that stops the entire attack because now f3 protects g4, plus the g-pawn is protected, 
because of the queen on e1 and white has a better defense. So instead f5, now he's going to go for the king. So bishop to c5, this is the whole reason of knight to a4. He wanted to control the c5 square and eventually take out the bishop. So that's what he's doing. So in this case, would knight to c3, trying to take out the powerful knight, be good? Well, after knight to f6, f3, knight to h5, bishop to f2 to protect the pawn, bishop to h4, now there's three attackers, only two defenders, g takes, knight to f4, and mate is inevitable. It's mate next move. So instead, he plays bishop to c5, and then black plays f4. Now, he's going at the g-pawn again, which is a weakness. Bishop takes e7, and now, here, white is hoping for black to play knight takes e7. Now, the reason why he's hoping for that is because if knight takes e7, now the knight's path to f6 is messed up. The knight would have to go back to d5, then to f6, and now it loses time. So he's not hoping for that. For black is not hoping for that. White is hoping for that, plus he also wins a pawn. So instead, he's going to do something even better, and that is pawn takes g3, threatening mate on the spot. And now, white has to respond with f takes g3, and now, instead of taking that bishop, knight to f3. A perfect game, and now here the game is pretty much lost. The only good defense is rook to f2. And let's just say rook takes check, well then rook takes here, queen to f2 to protect against the mate, loses the queen, and then after a few more moves, this is a simple win for black. So instead, rook to f2, the only defense that does not lose the queen, Queen takes g3, king to h1, rook takes f2, and now it's mate in just a few moves after queen takes rook, queen takes queen, it's mate next move. So that is a beautiful game showing the importance of the fiend shadowed bishop. Because with that bishop there, the position looks pretty good. However, right when h3 was played, it made the bishop's post on g2 even more vital, because now, in this position, the bishop can stay there, everything's fine, it can take the knight, however now, after h3, the queen is going to move up to attack the pawn, and now the bishop must stay on g2, and if it doesn't, like we saw, the queen gets into the king side, invades white, and even after this series of exchanges, a powerful knight comes in with the help of pawns, to destroy white's kingside because of the disappearance of the g2 bishop. Alright, so that concludes our video. Now let's take a look at a few key points. Key point 1. h3 or h6 should really only be played to support an attack, for example playing g4 or g5 the next move, of course if it's safe, or if it's absolutely needed, like in our first lesson, the first game, you saw that black had to play h6 in order to drive off the bishop, so he would get out of trouble. Otherwise, I like this quote, there are some remedies worse than disease. So to, to relate that to chess, basically the pin is the disease, and in your opponent trying to prevent the pin, he just allows a big kingside attack, and that's what's worse than the pin is checkmate. Also, key point two, ask yourself, is castling safe before you commit yourself to castling? Because once you castle, you're castled, and if there's an attack that your opponent has, then you're going to get checkmated and you're in deep trouble. Also, a big topic in this video was mechanical chess. Do not play it. Here's an example. The saying, castle as soon as possible, preferably kingside. Doing what you're told because you know it's normally right. So, you want to play like a master. A masters don't just castle kingside because that's what they're told to do. No, they think. They ask themselves, is castling now kingside safe? Should I postpone castling for later? Or, is the queenside an option? 
That is how Masters play, and that is how you have to play if you want to get better. So of course, you do have just a little homework. First assignment, do not play mechanical chess, because it is just going to tear you apart. You're going to get a ton of attacks on you, just don't do it. Play like the master. Alright, assignment number two, take a look at the chess.com Powerful Pawns news post, which there's a link below if you're not watching it directly from the post. At the bottom, there are a few tactics that you can practice about the h3, h6 target. Also, make sure you look for the follow-up of this video, how to create a weakness if your opponent won't do it for you. Also, below there's another link, and it is the game analysis link. It's a Google form where you can just submit the moves of the game, we do the rest, we get it back to you in whatever format you tell us to give it to you in. And normally we can get it back to you within a week, probably less. Also, please give us all the feedback you've got, questions, comments, concerns, anything, so these videos can be the best of quality for you. And finally, the Powerful Pawns YouTube channel is going to have a second series going, and it's called Chess Tricks and Traps. You can find that on the Powerful Pawns YouTube channel. Just search that up in the videos, and you can learn them, because you need to learn chess traps and tricks, because you don't want to fall for them. And you want to make sure that you never do fall for them. So that's all for this video. Thanks for watching.